Habib Allah Allah our God is the greatest The one and only glory to Him He born in humans to be the best And give His best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest The one and only glory to Him He born in humans to be the best And give His best religion to them Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to another live edition of Gardens of the Pious. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. All praises due to Allah alone. We all praise Him and we seek His help. Whomsoever Allah guides is a truly guided one and whomsoever Allah leaves astray, none can show Him guidance. May the greatest peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My dear viewers, we had a long break during the month of Ramadan from the program of Gardens of the Pious because we were going live every day, uh, almost, with Askuda. And today, inshallah, we resume. Today is the third day of the month of Shawwal and we resume with Gardens of the Pious. We're still studying a huge book which is known as Kitabul Umur al Anha, the matters that the Prophet Sallallahu either have forbidden or disliked, either haram or makruh. This is book number 17 in the compilation of Riyadh al-Salihin by Imam Yahya ibn Sharaf al-Nawawi. And in this book, there is a chapter, chapter number 332, which deals with the dislikeness of saying in your supplication, Allahumma gfirli in shi'at. Rather, one should say, O oh Allah, forgive me without uh, suspecting the answer. We'll learn what does it mean. The dislikeness of saying, O oh Allah, forgive me if you wish. As I said, this is chapter number 332. And right away, without any further ado, Hadith number 1743. This is a sound Hadith. And it is very profound, agreed upon its authenticity, collected by both Imam Bukhari and Muslim. And the narrator is the great companion, Abu Hurairah radiyallahu anhu. And Abu Hurairah radiyallahu anhu. أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لا يقول أن أحدكم اللهم اغفر لي إن شئت اللهم ارحمني إن شئت ليعزم المسألة فإنه لا مكره له In another narration by Imam Muslim ولكن ليعزم وليعظم الرغبة فإن الله تعالى لا يتعاظمه شيء أعطاه. I love this hadith, brothers and sisters. Not because it explains what is disliked and what is forbidden, but it talks about a very deep meaning. It was related also to a beautiful ayah that is mentioned in the middle of the course of the ayat of fasting. We've learned in Ramadan that the ayat of fasting from 183 to 187 of Surah Al-Baqarah, we'll go through them after learning the meaning of this hadith. Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, You must not supplicate saying, Oh Allah, forgive me if you wish. O oh Allah, have mercy on me if you wish. But rather, you should beg from Allah with certitude. For no one has the power to compel Allah. There is another narration, sound narration as well, by Imam Muslim, in which the Prophet ﷺ said, A supplication should be made in full confidence. And one should persistently express 
his eagerness, his desire before Allah in answering his supplication. For no bounty is too great for Allah to bestow upon his slaves. Allahu Akbar. So in the course of mandating fasting, the ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, beginning from ayah number 183, 184, 185, then 187, they're all talking about fasting, the rules and regulations of fasting, then 186, all of a sudden, a different topic, as it may appear for the first while for the audience. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانَ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ O Muhammad, peace be upon him, when my servants ask you concerning me, I am indeed near, so let them respond to my call of invoking him. Let them invoke me. I shall answer the supplication. Let them believe in me in order to be rightly guided. So the Almighty Allah, whether in Surah Al-Baqarah or in the other ayah of Surah Ghafir, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمُ دُعُونِي أَسْتَجِبَ لَكُمْ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي سَيَدُخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمَ دَاخِرِينَ Your Lord have commanded because supplication is the core of worship, is the topmost part of worship. So your Lord have commanded, Ud'uni supplicate to me, invoke me, astajib lakum. And if you do, I shall answer your call. I shall respond to your supplication. I shall grant you the good of what you've asked for. Watch this. So this is a divine promise. Did he say, Insha'Allah, no he didn't, which means guaranteed. The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, ما من مسلم يدعو بدعوة ليس فيها إثم ولا قطيعة رحم إلا أعطاه الله بها إحدى ثلاث. So whether me, or the most righteous person, or the very ordinary Muslim, anyone, of the Ummah, any Muslim who raises his hands or her hands and say, Oh Allah, give me or protect me or grant me or answer my supplication. As long as your supplication does not entail something that is forbidden. Yes, somebody falls in love with a married woman and he says, Oh Allah, make me marry her. This supplication is haram. And this dream is haram. And this wish is evil. So, of course, Allah would not answer this supplication. Even if it is coming from somebody who gives a lot of charity and been praying to Hajjud. Because the supplication is haram. You want to ruin a relationship of a couple so that you would marry this woman? I'm just giving you an example. Okay? Oh Allah, I wish I will get hired by this firm. What is this firm? It's a conventional banking system deal with riba. So Allah is not going to answer this supplication because this act is haram. This work is haram. Or a supplication that leads to severing the ties of the kinship. And how could you want Allah the Almighty to sever the ties of your kinship while he's the one who has commanded in the Quran repeatedly. وَيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَبِذِي الْقُرْبَى What? وَبِذِي الْقُرْبَى So when Allah the Almighty has commanded upholding the ties of kinship and you invoke him to sever it, he's not going to answer it. Even if you fulfill all the conditions, the requirements, and the recommendations of dua, your dua will be trashed, neglected, because it's haram. You're asking Allah for something that is forbidden. So once again, any Muslim, any Muslim who supplicates to Allah and ask him for anything as long as it is not forbidden, nor leads to severing the ties of kinship, 100% guaranteed, Allah has guaranteed that his or her supplication will be answered. 
But in the mind of most of us, answering the supplication that if I say, Oh Allah, I want to marry this girl. I wake up in the morning and find the girl and her family coming and knocking on our door. That uh, subhanallah, Allah inspired me that I want to marry you. This is not the way. Or this is not necessarily the way. It may happen this way. But the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, your supplication will be answered in one of three divine choices. And once again, who choose for you the answer? Allah, then it is always good. If Allah is going to choose, then it is always good. لا يقضي الله لعبده المؤمن قضاء إلا كان خيرا له any decree any choice that the Almighty Allah chooses for his believing servant is 100% gonna be good for him even if it appears for the first while as something bad but some good will come out of it trust Allah guaranteed so one is to give you an immediate answer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his divine infinite knowledge knows that this girl is good for you or this car is good for you or this guy is good for you if she's a girl who's supplicating and you both invoked Allah so he says Allah will make it easy for you uh, you want to be cured you want to get a job you want to pass the exam Allah the Almighty in his divine wisdom and infinite knowledge he knows this suits you best so he will deliver and make it easy great Alhamdulillah not any lesser than the first choice are the following two choices that Allah will not give you exactly what you ask for rather something equivalent to it will be used to protect you against the harm which was imminent to befall you. So the Almighty Allah will protect you against that. A car accident, a cancer, uh, COVID, and then somebody will uh, you know, get affected or die or be in oxygen to the rest of their lives. But I was asking, oh Allah, make it easy for me to go for Hajj. Allah didn't answer this dua exactly, but instead He protected you. Again is the car accident, again is the COVID, again is the cancer, again is failing the exam. Oh, okay, well, I'm happy with that. But I didn't know, and you don't have to know. Allah said about the believers, the very first quality of the believers, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ And that comes number one. First and foremost, they believe in Allah in the unseen. So they trust Him even without knowing the details. Then as a result, يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَمِمَّا رَزَقَنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ Did you ever think about it? So, mashallah, we pray and we say, Allahu Akbar! And we believe we are standing before Allah. Have you seen Him? No, I haven't. Fasted for a whole month and we're fasting today, the six days of Shawwal. Have you seen Him? No, we haven't. But the countless indications of his presence and the information that he provided us tells us enough about him. So we believe in him as if we can visualize and see him, even though we can't. That's called Ihsan though, mashallah. So as a result, he wards off and he protects you against a calamity or a musibah, a disaster, which was going to befall you. That too is good, alhamdulillah. And again, who is it choosing for you? You know when you go to the sweet shop and the guy says, would you like this and this and that? You know, you go to Turkey and mashallah, the, the variety of sweets and baklava and uh, uh, you know, the, the, the variety of sweets with nuts, it drives you crazy. You say, so what do you think? Give me what you like because it's too many. You trust the guy to give you what he likes. Don't you trust Allah to give you what he believes is good for you? And what he likes for you? Wallahi, I do. So once I make dua, I'm not worried about the answer. Amirul Mu'mineen, Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, said, I was never worried about answering my supplication. I'm only worried about supplicating. Because sometimes one forgets. Sometimes one is absent-minded, negligent. But once I make the supplication, I know the answer is guaranteed. 
in one of the three ways that the Messenger of Allah stated. Immediate response, as you wished, or warden of an evil that was, before, was about to befall you, or none of the above. Your dua will not be answered in the life of this world at all. He live in 60, 80 or 90 or 100 years, you will never see the answer of your supplication. But how good is that? You're saying that it is also good. Because Allah the Almighty is going to spare this dua to benefit you on the day of judgment. Which is better than the previous two. Wallahi. Because on the day of judgment, it is time for compensation and no time for work. While in the life of this world, it is time for work and no compensation. As far as reward of Jannah or punishment of Nar. Yani. So when your dua is being saved, then let me make much of dua. This is exactly what Allah wants from you. The companions, may Allah be pleased with them, used to supplicate Allah and invoke Him. Even for the least thing, for little minor thing, somebody wants to tie the shoe of his lace. Oh Allah, make it easy for me to tie my shoelace. Why? Because the supplication, mere supplicating to Allah indicates that Allah is the one who answers. Allah is the one who calls you to supplicate Him and invoke Him and you are responding to that. So this is an act of worship. Why shall I ask anyone if Allah is capable to do everything and anything for me and it does not fatigue him nor burden him? Sah? So, if this is the case, why do you still say, inshallah, when you make dua? You, you, you. Everyone who's watching me right now, and guess what? And me, sometimes. In Hajj, in Umrah, we just return. Everyone I met, everyone I met, when we make supplication, taqabbal Allah, Allah kabul kari, may Allah accept from all of us, inshallah. Everyone must add, inshallah. While the hadith says, when you supplicate, you should not say, inshallah. What is wrong with saying, inshallah? Inshallah, it's called, istithna. What does it mean, istithna? Yani, oh Allah, accept my Umrah if you want to. But he wants it. And that's why he said, supplicate me. Invoke me. When he permitted you and when he commanded you further, that means he's waiting for you to supplicate so he can answer. So why do you turn around if you want to? He already wanted. He already willed it. So adding insha'Allah to any supplication is abhorred, is disliked. Makru is undesirable. This is what the Prophet ﷺ said. The following narration of Imam Muslim explains why. It's like when you say, uh, if you want, do you mean that if you don't say if you want, you will compel Allah to give you? Of course not. He already decided if you supplicate, I will give you. So no one was to compel Allah the Almighty. So there is no need to say inshallah. But when do you say inshallah? In Surah Al-Kahf, the Almighty Allah say, teaching Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and his entire Ummah. وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدًا إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ وَاذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ إِذَا نَسِيتَ Allah said to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Never ever say I will do that tomorrow and tomorrow or Ghadan here does not necessarily mean tomorrow or day after tomorrow or next week. It rather means the mere future. Even if it is a few minutes later, an hour later. Don't you say, yeah, I will come to visit you in an hour without saying, inshallah, because you may not be able to do it. So saying inshallah is seeking the help of Allah and seeking his permission to do it. And just in case, if you forget, even after a while, oh my God, I didn't say inshallah, say it now. Remember your Lord, if you forget, 
Remember to say inshallah even after a while, even next day. This is the way you make it up. But, and as you know that on this screen we become like a family, aren't we? Uh, this is a question for you. Everyone who's watching us on the social media right now, tell me if you feel this way or not. I feel it this way. We feel we're a family. We feel, I feel when I'm conversing with you, it's like you're sitting in front of me and I can see you, even though I cannot visualize you. So I want to be very honest with you. And sometimes honesty hurts. All right? Unfortunately, the use of the phrase, inshallah, has been put in the wrong context. So sometimes when you ask a person, you meet, so brother, how are you? What is your name? He said, Muhammad, inshallah. Well, what do you mean, Muhammad, inshallah? Ahmed, Michael, Aisha, inshallah. Inshallah, my friend, inshallah, bro, means in the future. If Allah wills, but he already willed. Since you were born, and your parents choose that name for you, he had already willed. So why do you say, inshallah, 20 years later, 40 years later, what is your name? Ahmed, alhamdulillah. Oh, so I can say alhamdulillah, yeah, it's a good name. But inshallah is, لا تقولن لشيء إني فاعل ذلك غدا. The future, but this is no future. This is past. So what is your name? Muhammad. You want to say Alhamdulillah? Okay. Did you go for Umrah? Yes, I went last year, inshallah. That doesn't make any sense. I went for Umrah last year, inshallah. And inshallah is for the future. Don't you know Arabic? No. Oh, don't you know English? Even in your mother tongue, when you say, I went for Hajj last year. You should say Alhamdulillah, not Insha'Allah. Also, new Muslims have cut us, cut us making a lot of promises and then saying Insha'Allah. And they figure that, oh, okay, since you said Insha'Allah, then you're not going to do it. That hurts. That hurts anyone. And that is not befitting. I'm coming to see you when tomorrow, Insha'Allah. I promise you I will do it, inshallah. Oh, so they say, if he says inshallah, then he's not going to do it. That is not befitting, brothers and sisters. If you say I'm going to do anything, then you should fulfill it. And when you say inshallah, that is prescribed in the Quran. لا تقولن لشيء إني فاعل ذلك غدا إلا أن يشاء الله. What you should say, inshallah, God willing. But you should have the will as well. You should intend to do so. You know, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man akhada amwala al-nasi yuridu ada'aha adda allahu anhu. وَمَنْ أَخَذَهَا يُرِيدُ إِتْلَافَهَا أَتْلَافَهُ اللَّهِ This hadith is addressing certain people. When they see rich ones or well of people, so they say, I need a loan. Can you give me 500 or 5,000 or 50,000? Why? Wallahi, my mother is sick and I'm in trouble and I will go to jail. So the person's heart will feel bad for that person, will get soft and will give him the money. Okay, this is expected from the Muslim Ummah. But the beggar or the borrower or the debtor, when he requested the money, he never intended to pay it back. Why? Because he says, this guy is rich enough, he's not going to even remember. While when he was taking the money, he assured him, I swear to Allah, in a couple months I will pay you back, just once I finish uh, you know, work, once I get paid, and in his heart, even though he said, Inshallah, I promise, Wallahi, Wallahi, Inshallah. But he's a liar. Who knew that he's a liar? The one who knows. As-sirra wa akhfa alimun bidhati sudur The one who knows what is hidden in the chest. So the Prophet ﷺ said, If Allah knew 
that this person, the debtor, when he borrowed the money, he intended to pay it back and on time, Abdullahu an. It will be the duty of Allah to help him out to settle his debt without asking how. But if Allah the Almighty knew that this person when he borrowed the money, he was never planning to pay it back because he thought this guy is rich. We've seen many incidents like that. Atlafahu Allah. So he said, Wallahi, Billahi, Tallahi, I swear I will pay you by the end of the month. And here he is planning not to pay. He's a liar. So who knew that? Allah the Almighty. Even though he said, Insha'Allah, but Allah would ruin him and would ruin his wealth. So when one says, Insha'Allah, brothers and sisters, he should really mean it. Coming to visit you tomorrow, Insha'Allah. Uh, you should say, Insha'Allah. But were you planning? Yes. I'm really planning to visit him or her or pay back or do whatever, Insha'Allah. The handy people, you call the carpenter, you call the plumber, you call the electrician. When are you coming? Tomorrow, tomorrow, same time, don't worry about it. And inside of him, so his assistant says, but tomorrow we have an appointment. We're going to another uh, district. He says, I know, I know, just let him. It's just a word of a mouth. You're a liar. So here we've got to learn the context of saying, inshallah. And when to say it? Huh? In dua, never say inshallah. Let's see if we can train ourselves and stick to it. The second hadith. Uh, is hadith number 1744 and Anas radiallahu anhu قال إذا دعا أحدكم فليعزم المسألة ولا يقولن اللهم إن شئت فأعطني فإنه لا مستكره له متفق عليه Ah, uh, I guess you've all become scholars and you can explain this hadith to me better Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said in the hadith which is narrated by Anas and it is agreed upon its authenticity. Whenever one of you makes dua, let him be decisive and let him not say inshallah in the dua. Why? Because no one has the power to compel Allah. And in the previous hadith we have learned فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَتَعَظَمُهُ شَيْءٌ أَعْطَى There is no bounty that is too great for Allah. Yani some people might say, I say inshallah because I'm asking for something too big. Like what? Oh Allah, oh Allah, Ya Rabb, make it easy for me to travel to the States and get the U.S. citizenship and marry and have children. I think that's too much. So I would say inshallah then you don't know whom you're dealing with. You know, we are in Shawwal already. The government of KC announced that they will accept one million hujjaj. This is a quarter of the number which normally perform hajj. So under regular conditions, <coughs> you are not able because <coughs> you're miskeen. Now the prices have doubled and the competition has tripled. And even become quadrant. So you say, I don't think I'm going to make it. This is called su'u dhanni billah. You don't know whom you're dealing with. You're not thinking good of Allah. Ya Allah, oh Allah, make it easy for me to perform hajj and umrah this year. But how? It's none of your business. Inna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. Indeed, Allah is able to do all things. You've made the dua, you've made it with sincerity. Let Allah answer your dua in the way that he knows best. It suits you best. It's time to take a short break, brothers and sisters. And we'll be back, inshallah, in a few minutes. Meanwhile, I'd like to hear from you, where you're watching from, and how was your aid. Stay tuned. We'll be back, inshallah, in a few minutes. Rasulullah, Habib Allah. Rasulullah, Habib Allah. Assalamu alaikum, 
wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back my dear viewers just wanted to remind you in the second segment of gardens of the pious program we open all our phone lines and make them available to take your uh, questions calls and concerns and for that let me quickly remind you with our phone numbers beginning with the whatsapp numbers area code 001 361 alternatively area code 001 then 347 8060025 then the local numbers air code 002 then 01095185170 and finally air code 002 then 01005469323 and sister halima from kenya welcome to huda tv halima assalamu alaikum halima <coughs> Can you hear me, Sister Halima? Hello, Assalamu Alaikum. Alaikum Salam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Go ahead. I have two questions. Please. One question is about uh, giving out the Eid al Fitr to an Imam in a village, and then he collects on behalf of the people he's in charge of, the one who's teaching Quran and leading in prayers. And uh, he's making like a feast, like lunch for all of them. Mm. So the people giving the petrol to that person, is that okay? No, that is not okay. If it is done from the voluntary charity, it is perfectly okay. But Zakatul Fitr has a specific means and a specific way to distribute it. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, he calculate how many family members and on behalf of each family member, one saw of food, 2.6 to 3 kilogram of rice or grains or raisin or dates, and to be handed as is to the poor people. You're not required, you know, you're asked to make food for them. This is one thing. Secondly, the requirement for zakatul fitri or sadaqatul fitri is to be paid before salatul eid. And the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, if it is postponed until after Salatul Eid, it is just a voluntary charity and the person is blameworthy for not paying the zakah. So you're saying that he will prepare a feast for them, obviously it will be after Eid. That is not permissible. Give everyone their due rights. Let's say the Imam who leads us in the prayer. This morning after I prayed Fajr, respected sister Halima, I sat with my family. And I was telling them that sometimes when we distribute money in charity and zakah, we completely forget about the imams, the khatib, the one who's leading us in the prayer. Because we think that the imams are well off and they're rich. So I said you have to look for them and investigate if they are in need or not. And when you give them, you don't just give them a little bit because they're not beggars. The Almighty Allah said about them, يَحْسَبُهُمُ الْجَاهِرُ أَغْنِيَاءَ مِنَ التَّعَفُّفِ A person who doesn't know about the real condition would think that they're rich, while in their house, there's no food. His kids are in schools and in college, and he cannot afford the tuitions, cannot afford the transportations. Why? Because you think he's an imam. Yeah, but the imam doesn't receive a shower of gold and silver. So, is he eligible? He's more eligible than others if he is poor. So when I give him, I don't give him a thousand or two, I give him 10 grains. Because I know it will be only me or a handful of people like me who will pay attention to him. So as zakah, well, the zakatul mal has to be given in cash. Zakatul fitri, it is best to be given, as the Prophet Sallallahu said, in food. To be handed to the poor in their hands and let them do whatever they want to do with it. They throw a party and they get together and eat. This is none of our business. Thank you, Halima. Assalamu alaikum. Halima, go ahead. Okay, have another question. Yeah. When we're doing uh, Aqiqa mm. or Eid al for Eid al Adha, mm. sometimes we, we get the animals, but uh, the community that keeps them, they do the ear notching. For marking. They do what? Is that permissible? They don't have any other defects except they cut those ears. Mm. No, they shouldn't do that. Rather, they should hang something in the neck 
anacolus or whatever that says it belongs to so and so because again they're going to slit the ears of how many okay and why do you torture an animal for no reason nowadays you can actually with a shaver carve the name against the fur you can wear uh, you can uh, put a necklace or an earring or whatever around the ear or the neck of the cattle to be recognized it belongs to so and so with a spray marker it will be written now in Uthiyah uh, last year mashallah we've slaughtered about uh, I mean too many too many heads I don't want to say how many so with the marker we just marked number one two four ten eighty whatever and on the sheet, number two belongs to so and so. Number ten belongs to so and so. So there are too many ways to recognize the cattle. Thank you, Sister Halima. Any other questions? Muhammad from Brunei. Assalamu alaikum, brother Muhammad. Go ahead. <coughs> uh, first of all, I would just like to say, uh, may Allah bless you and your team. And grant you all genetic those You have been helping us uh, really a lot with our questions. Uh, thank you very much, Sheikh. I just want You're to appreciate that. Before the, uh, I, have, I, have, I, have, uh, I have three short questions, but if you have the time, then uh, you can do it. Sheikh, Sheikh the, my first question is that, uh, is listening to lectures, Islamic lectures, is it considered a, as an act of worship? Do I get reward for watching such lectures? And the second question is, Sheikh, uh, regarding Surah Al-Fatiha, I come from India, Sheikh, where I, 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 I learned that the word you're supposed to recite in Fatiha is Lord. I mean, Dod, instead of saying Lord, Swat al and Amta Alihim. The way I learned it in India is that they taught me the letter Lord. But then I I found out online that some of them used to say the letter Dod. So I don't know which is uh, grammatically correct when reciting the Al-Fatiha. Uh, my third question, Sheikh, mm -hmm. is that uh, when I usually, uh, sometimes when the reverts come to me for asking help in uh, some, some Islamic questions, I try to help them by looking at Islam QA, watching your lectures. I try to gather all the resources that I can, then I try to give them a genuine answer. But what happens is that sometimes, Sheikh, it, it, uh, it becomes a, a mistake sometimes. Although I genuinely tried my best, I tried all, I exhausted all the resources that I can, I tried to help them, but then sometimes it becomes a mistake. Am I sinful for that? Is it best for me that I don't answer them whenever they come to me? I just say I, I am not qualified <coughs> to answer. And I just, so exactly. I just need help with this. Muhammad from Brunei, first question, listening to... Islamic lectures to learn is a great act of worship. أنا نبي صلى الله عليه وسلم said خيركم من تعلم القرآن وعلمه. The best of you is the one who learns the Quran and teaches it to others. And anything would lead to better understanding the Quran is learning the Quran. Secondly, pronouncing the letter ضاد as ضاء. So you know when, when calling names, you call somebody, brother is one, and it's even written Z, not D. I don't mind if this is your way, even though there is no Rizwan in Arabic. Rather, the name Ridwan, Ridwan means the pleasure of Allah, and here Ridwan is the name of the God of heaven. But you guys have changed the name to Rizwan, it's your call. But when it comes to the recitation of the Quran, it's a mistake and it changes the meaning. To say, غير المغزوب عليهم ولا الظالين There is no ضاء here. It's ضاد. Okay? Some people get angry. Well, we get to learn and read the Quran the way the Prophet Sallallahu used to read it. Not your way. Not my way. So when you read in the Quran, you should pronounce رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عن. You don't say رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عن. Because it's messed up. It changes the meaning. Subhanallah. Making an effort to assist new Muslims, answer their questions, sometimes check <coughs> on reliable and authentic websites and giving them the answer, you will be rewarded for that. And if you were to make unintended mistakes you're not blameworthy inshallah and always ask ulama shiuch scholars uh, in order to educate yourself because most of these questions are repetitive 
And some questions, even if you make a mistake, it will not be a big deal. But some answers can take the person out of the fold of Islam. So be careful with what you transmit to the new Muslims and share with them. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Walid from the Netherlands, welcome to ask uh, to Huda TV, Walid. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum, uh, I got three quick questions. Uh, can someone uh, who was a thief in the past and changed his life uh, repent, but he cannot return the items back, but he, uh, what you call it, uh, do extra good deeds like giving out bicycles and phones to to get forgiveness. That's my first question. Uh, second question is, if someone saves life can, and he did bad deeds, does the good deeds still count? And the third question is, uh, if you were born in the Netherlands and they teach you shirk in elementary school, do the teachers uh, be held accountable for that? Or that's my question, Sif. Thank you, Walid, from the Netherlands. When a thief repents, will his repentance ac accepted? Will his repentance be accepted? Repentance is always accepted as long as you fulfill its conditions. Whenever the sin involves a third party, not just between you and Allah, the condition is to settle the case between you and that person or persons. In the case of theft, the amount or the items which have been stolen in order for repentance to be accepted must be returned back to its owners. Allah says in Surah Tunisa, chapter number 4, Inna Allah ya'murukum an tu'addu al-amanati ila ahliha. In case that you don't know who is this person that you stole from him his wallet or her purse, he cannot reach them. You don't know how to get hold of them. Or they died. Or it's 30 years ago. I don't have an access to them. But do you know how much you've stolen? Yes. Then this amount must be given totally in a charity. And it will be on behalf of those whom you have committed theft from. Well, unfortunately, I don't have any cash on me. I'm broke. Give as much as you can and the rest along with sincere tawbah, lots of istighfar, crying for your sins, making dua for those whom you stole from them and hurt them, ask and Allah to pardon them, and hopefully Allah will accept your tawbah. Saving lives, would that forgive sins? Saving lives is actually on top of the greatest deeds, because Allah the Almighty says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, من أجل ذلك كتبنا على بني إسرائيل أنه من قتل نفسا بغير نفس أو فساد في الأرض فكأنما قتل الناس جميعا ومن أحياها فكأنما أحيا الناس جميعا As Allah has ordained even in the Torah before killing a single person innocent soul without a justification it's equivalent to killing all human beings and also saving the life of a single human being is equivalent to saving the lives of all human beings. A teacher who's working in the West and teaching shirk, is he blameworthy? Of course he's blameworthy. You know, uh, you, you guys don't understand one thing. We fear for our risk and we worry about our provision more than we fear of hellfire, more than we fear of Allah. While the risk is in Allah's hand, it is controlled by Allah. And He promised any time, any time you leave anything for the sake of Allah, Allah will give you better than what you left for Him. <coughs> And inshallah, hopefully some other time when we have time, we'll share with you some live and real stories in this respect. If you have to teach something wrong or against your Islamic values, say, no, it's against my values. 
We are in a free country. I don't believe in that. Well, if they fire you, good luck. Alhamdulillah, look for another lawful job. But I trust you are living in a free country. And if anything contradicts your values, you don't have to believe. You don't have to learn. And if you teach, you tell them that the, this is wrong, guys. This is wrong. You teach the children. When we were studying even at Al-Azhar, biology. So we were studying the evolution theory and Darwinism. And we're saying this is absolutely false. It's a fake theory. Because Allah says in Surah Ali Imran, إِنَّ مَثَلَ عِيسَى عِنْدَ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ آدَمَ خَلَقَهُ مِنْ تُرَابٍ ثُمَّ قَالَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ etc. And we quote the evidences. So when I teach comparative religions and I teach about the various religions and their deviations, I'm not being a mushrik or a kafir or disrespectful to Islam or to Allah. I'm teaching people about what is wrong to avoid it and also to say Alhamdulillah for having guided us to the true religion. If this is the case and if this is what you're going to do in the class, it makes sense and becomes permissible. But you teach it as is. You teach something that like says that God is everywhere and in everything around us, even it is within ourselves. God is love and if you love, then you're that you know extreme mystic Sufis and this is you find it in Hinduism you find it in Buddhism you find it in many other religions but not in Islam okay Islam and to become a Muslim you must condemn by your heart taking other deities as lords or as gods Barakallahu fikum do we still have uh, another Time for another caller. Sister Khadija from the case. Hey, go ahead quickly. We'll take Muhammad from Belgium as well, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, Muhammad, go ahead. How are you? I'm uh, fine. And Eid uh, Mubarak wa taqabbalah minna wa minkum, ya sheikh. Wa kulukum. Taqabbalah wa minkum. Ameen. Thank you. Ameen. Uh, my uh, question, my two questions uh, are the following. Uh, can we combine the Sunnah prayer of Fajr uh, with Tahiyatul Masjid? Uh, that is my first question. And uh, the second question is, uh, what is the judgment or the ruling about uh, almost falling in sleep uh, during, uh, for example, uh, Isha prayer or uh, Taraweeh prayer during the last days of Ramadan? Do we have to make up uh, for uh, the fart prayer, uh, the fart prayers, uh, in this case, uh, the Isha you, prayer? You mean falling asleep, falling asleep? Like you're in sujood and you fell asleep? Uh, almost falling asleep, hardly, almost falling asleep. Not, not, not falling down, but... Uh, what do you mean, almost? It, oh, it's either you slept to the extent you don't know whether you said Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la or not. And sometimes, guess what? Because when I was uh, a kid, and my parents used to take me for Fajr uh, after a long light of uh, prayers and so on in Ramadan. I, I used to do it. I used to fall asleep in the first sajda until the second sajda. So the prayer is nullified because you actually fell asleep and in a position which maybe you have uh, void your wudu. So you will have to redo not just the salah, the wudu as well. Okay? Yes. Any other questions? <coughs> Yes, about uh, the combination of uh, Sunnah Fajr and Tahiyyatul Masjid. Yes, of course. If you enter the Masjid and you pray any prayer, whether Sunnatul Fajr or Sunnatul Zuhr or the Fardu prayer, then you don't have to pray Tahiyyatul Masjid. Tahiyyatul Masjid is an emphatic Sunnah. Only if you enter the Masjid and there is no prayer due, so you do not sit down before praying Tahiyyatul Masjid, even if the Imam on Friday is giving the Friday sermon. Brothers and sisters, thank you so much. May Allah bless you all. Happy and blessed day to all of you, your loved ones and your families and to the entire ummah. Until next episode, I leave you all in the care of Allah. قولوا قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. To be the best and give his best religion to them. So, why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about him in paradise.
Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price Rasulullah